This is the second half of Principles of Biology, Chapter 2, where we were talking about uh, chemical bonds. And I wanted to start by describing a strong chemical bond called the covalent bond. And covalent bonds are formed when two atoms share one or more pairs of electrons with each other. And usually the reason they're sharing electrons is they both want to have uh, outer shells that are not filled, and by sharing electrons with each other, they can try to fill their, their outer shells. Um, so, for example, we could have two hydrogen atoms here. Uh, each hydrogen atom right, has one electron in that first shell, which could hold up to two electrons. Um, so each of these would like to try to pick up another electron in that, in that shell. And they can do that simply by uh, sitting very close to each other so that that pair of electrons will spend some time orbiting around both atomic nuclei. So as long as they stay in this, this position close to each other, each one of these hydrogen atoms basically thinks it's got its, uh, its outermost shell filled, and uh, so they're going to tend to stay in that position. So covalent bonds, I said, are strong bonds, uh, meaning once, once that bond is formed, you would have to put in a fair amount of energy to break them, to break that bond, pull those atoms apart. Um, so, you know, you could do that in, in various ways. You could have an enzyme that breaks that bond, or you could just heat things up uh, and break that bond. But, you know, at the temperatures at which you find most living cells um, on Earth, Covalent bonds tend to be very stable, so that doesn't mean they can't be broken or can't change, but they, they are strong, stable bonds. So that is, that is very simply the, the basis of a covalent bond. Uh, two or more atoms sharing electrons with each other. And, um, you know, you could have an atom like carbon, which I already mentioned, which has four electrons in its outer shell that could hold up to eight. So as I, as I uh, said a few in the first half, carbon is, is uh, very reactive and looking to, to uh, form bonds with lots of other atoms. So for example here, we've got one atom of carbon that could form four different covalent bonds with, in this case, four hydrogen atoms. Right? So we form methane in this particular instance. Uh, this would be considered a compound because we're taking um, atoms of two different elements, or two or more elements really would give you a compound, and bonding them together. Um, and so in this case, basically everybody's happy, right? So the, the carbon, it now thinks it's got eight electrons in its outer shell. The hydrogens all think they've got two electrons in their outer shell, so everybody's content, and that's going to be a, a very stable molecule. Um, we talked about atomic weight, atomic mass. Um, you can have a similar idea of molecular weight. We, we could also refer to this as a molecule, right? Basically, any time you're joining two atoms, two or more atoms together, you are forming a molecule. Um, so the weight of that molecule, if you know, we could be determined if you know the, the atomic uh, weight of hydrogen and the atomic weight of carbon. You simply add it all up, right? The weight of four hydrogens plus one carbon would give us the molecular weight of methane. Um, and I also wanted to point out here that there's some, some different common ways to represent covalent bonds in molecular structures. So you could have what are called structural, or structural formulas, excuse me, where the covalent bonds are represented by lines or maybe pairs of dots. Um, you'll also see ball and stick models where um, it's a bit more of like a 3D version of uh, what you see over here on the left where the covalent bonds are, again, lines. Or you could have a space filling model where the, um, the atoms are represented proportionally based on their sizes. So anyway, just don't be surprised if you see all or all of these as you go through uh, future chapters. And you're, you're probably aware of this, but there are different types of covalent bonds. So you could have a 
the most, most uh, common type would be a single covalent bond where you've got two atoms just sharing one pair of electrons, but you could also have double or triple covalent bonds where you have two atoms sharing two pairs or even three pairs of electrons. Um, those will be represented by double or triple lines respectively. Um, and I also wanted to, another way uh, covalent bonds could be different is I wanted to introduce this idea of electronegativity and what are called polar or nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, so uh, different atoms can have different electronegativity and this is really just a fancy way of saying the attractive force that a particular atom has on electrons. And if you think about that, okay, well, what would give one atom basically a bigger pull on electrons than another atom? And it all comes down to charge, right? So remember, electrons are negatively charged. So what's going to attract negatively charged electrons is a positive charge, right? Protons. So the, the bottom line here is the more protons a particular atom has in its atomic nucleus, the more positive charge in that nucleus, the bigger of an attractive force that atom is going to have on other electrons. Um, and so that can create this phenomenon of what are called polar covalent bonds. So if, for example, you have a covalent bond forming between two atoms that have different numbers of protons in their atomic nucleus, like in this case, a uh, covalent bond is formed between oxygen and hydrogen, right? The hydrogen just has a single proton. Um, the oxygen, if I'm remembering correctly, has um, eight, I believe. I might have that wrong. So don't quote me on that. But anyway, it's got more protons, right? So the oxygen atom is going to have a bigger pull on these electrons that are being shared. So these, these electrons, these shared electrons, are going to actually spend more of their time orbiting around the uh, oxygen atom than they will around the hydrogen atom, just because they're more attracted to, to those protons in the oxygen's atomic nucleus. Same thing over here, right? It's obviously a water molecule, H2O. These shared electrons are also going to share, spend more of their time around the oxygen than around the hydrogen. So that would be considered a polar covalent bond. And the significance of that is because those electrons are not being shared evenly, um, that's going to create these little partial positive and negative charges on this molecule. So the little delta signs here, partial, so you've got a partial positive charge, partial negative charge. But what you see here is the oxygen at, uh, atom basically gains a little bit of a negative charge and the hydrogens gain a little bit of a positive charge. And as I was just explaining, right, that is because the negative electrons here that are being shared, right, are spending more of their time around the oxygen. So the oxygen's getting a little bit more of a negative charge. And those negative electrons are spending less time around the hydrogens, so they get a little bit of a positive charge. Um, so anytime you have a polar covalent bond, you're going to get these positive, uh, excuse me, partial positive and negative charges. And those partial charges can be very important, as we're going to see here in a moment. So that's a polar covalent bond. If you have two uh, atoms that are sharing the electrons very evenly, so for example, between two hydrogens, right, both atoms have the same number of protons, we call that a nonpolar covalent bond. The electrons are shared very evenly. All right, so we have those strong covalent bonds. They can be polar, they can be nonpolar, uh, depending on the particular atoms involved. Um, now I wanted to shift over and talk about some of these weak bonds, and those include ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds, etc. And I'll just kind of run through the list here and give you a brief description of each. We'll start with ionic bonds. And uh, ionic bonds are attractions between uh, two different ions, and ions are defined as atoms that have a full positive or negative charge, not just the partial charges that we were just talking about, but these would be full charges. So what does that mean? How do you get a full charge on an atom? 
Um, you know, we already discussed the fact that atoms should be very balanced. You know, if they have a, you know, 10 protons in their nucleus, they should have 10 electrons orbiting around uh, to balance out that charge. Well, the way we get uh, full charges would be something like this. This is kind of the classic example. You've got a sodium atom here that has 11 electrons, and so it just has one lonely electron in its outermost shell that could hold up to eight. And then over here you have a chlorine atom. It's got 17 electrons, so its outermost shell has seven electrons in it. It could hold up to eight again. And so in this case, instead of just sharing electrons with each other, um, that chlorine atom uh, is going to be able to actually steal that electron away from the sodium atom, just completely pull it out of its orbital and take it into its own. So now in this case, you've got the sodium atom has lost an electron, so it's now unbalanced in terms of its protons and electrons. So it has what we would call a full positive charge. It's a positively charged ion, we would say, which is called a cation. And the chlorine atom now has gained an extra electron, so it's got 18 electrons, 17 protons, so it's got a full negative charge, negatively charged ion, you would call an anion. And now this is where it gets a little bit awkward, right? So the chlorine just stole that electron away from the sodium, but now because these two atoms have opposite charges, those opposite charges are going to be attracted to each other, right? So they're going to... Uh, tend to stay very close to each other because of those opposite charges, and that is the, the definition of an ionic bond, just that attraction between two oppositely charged ions. You know, it's going to tend to hold those atoms in close proximity. Okay, so that's a, it's a weaker bond than a covalent bond. We could pull those ions apart with, with less energy than we would need to break a covalent bond. Um, yeah, you're, you're probably at least uh, uh, indirectly familiar with, with this example of ionic bonds, right? So here we've got salt, sodium chloride, right? which is what we were just talking about here, sodium ions and chloride ions. So those atoms will uh, uh, cluster together into salt crystals, right? Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with the idea that if you put salt in water, that salt dissolves very easily, right? And the reason for that is comes down to those, those partial positive and negative charges on water molecules. So if you put the salt crystal into that aqueous environment, into water, um, the water molecules can basically peel off the sodium and the chloride ions and surround them with uh, either their partial positive or partial negative charges and basically prevent them from, from bonding back together. Okay, so we had uh, weak ionic bonds. The next type of weak bond on that list are what are called hydrogen bonds. And so that name, it's tempting to think, oh, a hydrogen bond is just going to be a bond between two hydrogens, but uh, it's not quite that simple. There is always a hydrogen involved. That's where the name comes from. Um, but this is going to come back to this idea of partial charges. So to have a hydrogen bond, you always have to have a hydrogen that has a partial positive charge. How do you get that? Well, like we just talked about before, you would have to have a hydrogen that's that's part of a polar covalent bond, right? This hydrogen is part of a water molecule. You have this polar covalent bond, right, where the electrons are not being shared evenly, so that's giving that hydrogen that partial positive charge. So it doesn't have to be a water molecule, but it would have to be some similar situation, right? Hydrogen that's part of a polar covalent bond, so it's got that partial charge. And then um, that partial positive charge on the hydrogen is going to be attracted to a partial negative charge on uh, an atom in some other molecule. So in this case, it's an oxygen on another water molecule, but it could be really any, any other molecule would do. So you can kind of think of the, the hydrogen bond as sort of like a light version of an ionic bond, right? You've got that partial positive charge on your hydrogen attracted to the partial negative charge on some other atom. Okay, 
that's going to hold those two together. So we see hydrogen bonds all over the place in biology. So you know, as you see here, you get hydrogen bonds between water molecules. We're going to talk about water at the end of this chapter. Um, we see hydrogen bonds holding the two strands of DNA together. We see hydrogen bonds helping uh, proteins. It's supposed to be like big proteins. Um, basically fold up into the correct shape. And we're going we're gonna to talk about protein folding in some upcoming chapters. So hydrogen bonds are very biologically important. Uh, the third type of weak bond on that list is what were called hydrophobic interactions. And so to talk about this, we need to understand the terms hydrophobic and hydrophilic. You may already know those. Um, philic is loving, so hydrophilic is something that likes to interact with water. Hydrophobic would be something that does not like to interact with water, water hating or fearing. Um, and so what, what would make you love or, or fear water if you're a molecule? Well, again, it all comes back to those partial positive and negative charges that are found on water. So um, if you are a molecule that does not have any partial or full charges yourself, you are not going to like to interact with those uh, partially charged water molecules. So primarily this would be things like lipids, fats tend to be very uh, nonpolar, very hydrophobic, right? They don't have any charges or any partial charges. And so if you put those kinds of molecules in the presence of water, they are basically just going to cluster together, right? They're going to be forced together just trying to get away from those partially charged waters. Um, so that would be considered a hydrophobic interaction, is just those those non-charged, non-polar molecules just trying to get away from, from the water. It's going to force them together. So that's also a weak bond. And then the last one, last weak bond on the list is actually the weakest of all of them. It's what are called van der Waals forces or van der Waals interactions. And I'm not going to go into the um, the mechanism of these, but I just want you to know these are very, very transient, very weak uh, bonds. So they're forming and breaking in just fractions of a, a millisecond. And so you might think, well, that sounds pretty useless, right? If these bonds are so weak and so transient, then, you know, what's what's the point? And, you know, individually, yeah, they're, they're not going to be very consequential. But if you have a lot of Van der Waals interactions, uh, they can actually add up and be quite strong. So you might you might be familiar with uh, geckos that can actually walk up a you know a glass wall, and the way they do that uh, turns out is due to Van der Waals interactions between uh, atoms and the the surface of cells and these little projections on their fingertips and atoms in the glass. So you're getting just you know, tons and tons of these very transient, weak Van der Waals interactions between the, the fingertips and the, the glass, and that's going to be enough to actually hold that, that gecko up and allow it to climb straight up the wall. All right, <clears throat> so uh, all, of, all of what we've been talking about so far, all these different types of bond formations, would really be considered chemical reactions, right? So anytime you have atoms uh, bumping into each other and you are either forming a new bond between two atoms or breaking an existing bond between two atoms, that would be considered a chemical reaction. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit later in some upcoming chapters uh, about chemical reactions. But a lot of those that we see are going to be what are called oxidation reduction reactions. So just kind of tuck that term away in the, the back of your head, but we will come back to that. All right, so let's talk for a minute about water. So um, water is key for biology, is key for life on Earth. And I've got a little laundry list here of characteristics of water that make it so important for life on Earth. Some of these uh, may be pretty obvious. So, for example, the last one on the list here, um, water is basically the solute for all biochemistry, right? So your body, your cells are mostly water. 
So all the chemistry that's happening in your body is happening in that aqueous environment surrounded by water. Um, but there's, there's some other key characteristics. So um, when water freezes, it forms ice, right? Ice is less dense than water. It turns out that is pretty important, big picture in terms of uh, life on Earth. Water has what's called a high specific heat, a high heat of vaporization. It's very cohesive. So I'll, I'll give you a quick description of these and explain why these are important for, for uh, life on Earth. So, okay, so you're, you're familiar with ice and the fact that, that ice floats on top of water. And uh, just to give you some idea of what's happening at the atomic level, in liquid water, right, the water molecules are being held together by hydrogen bonds, as I already mentioned, between water molecules, right, those partial positive and negative charges attracting each other. Um, those are weak bonds, so at room temperature, those hydrogen bonds are just constantly breaking and reforming, right? So, you know, two water molecules are bonded together, that bond breaks, and now, you know, one of those waters goes and bonds to different water molecules. So, constantly changing partners. Um, if we heat things up, um, some of those water molecules will start moving so fast that they will actually... Uh, Sh you know, shoot out of the 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 mix um, and uh, evaporate, right? Whereas if we drop the temperature, now there's not enough heat energy to break those hydrogen bonds, and so a hydrogen bond will form and it just stays there, stabilizes, and you will end up with this lattice-like crystalline structure that is ice. So stable hydrogen bonds between water molecules and as you can see here the water molecules are being held a little bit farther apart because those bonds are stable and so that's going to make the ice less dense than water so the ice will float and in terms of life on earth this is important because it's going to prevent large bodies of water from freezing solid so what will happen is you know, you start to form ice, that ice floats to the top of the body of water, and um, it will actually form a little insulating layer so we can still have liquid water underneath that can sustain life, because there's not much that can live in, in ice, especially long term. All right, what about these two other characteristics? I mentioned uh, water has a high specific heat, high heat of vaporization. Um, so specific heat is defined as the amount of heat you have to uh, put into uh, a substance to raise the temperature of one gram of that substance by one degree Celsius. So when I say water has a high specific heat, that means that compared to, oops, sorry, compared to other molecules, you have to put in a large amount of heat to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree Celsius. So it can absorb quite a lot of heat before it changes its temperature. And this is, this is critical because that means water, and we have lots of water on planet Earth, right, can absorb a lot of this heat energy out of the atmosphere. Um, so that is critical because it helps moderate climate on planet Earth. And similarly, water has a high heat of vaporization, meaning the amount of heat water can absorb before it vaporizes, right, before, before this happens, right, um, is high. So not only is water absorbing a lot of heat out of the atmosphere, but it can do that without vaporizing, right? It would be bad if all of our bodies of water just completely evaporated when you had a, you know, sunny 70 degree day. Um, so it's going to prevent those uh, the the water on earth from evaporating at lower temperatures and of course in terms of organismal biology or right, at our own biology we use this uh, this phenomenon of evaporation and evaporative cooling to help maintain our our body temperatures and then uh, the last characteristic I want to mention is what's called cohesion um, and this just refers to the fact that not only do water molecules bond to each other, but they can also bond um, to uh, other molecules in this cohesive way. So um, this gives you phenomenon like surface tension or 
really important for life on Earth. We think of photosynthesis, right, which is providing the source of essentially all sugars on, on planet Earth. Um, for photosynthesis to happen, you have to have water moving from the roots up into the leaves. Sometimes that may be a journey of, you know, hundreds of feet. Um, and really the only way you can do that, get water all the way up from the roots to the, the canopy of, say, a large tree in this unbroken chain is because of the cohesiveness between water molecules um, and between water molecules and the, the vascular system of that water transport system of that plant. So the water is cohesive. And then uh, lastly, well, you know, I mentioned the idea that uh, water is the uh, the solvent for all the biochemistry that's happening in our bodies, and we can't we can't talk about uh, basic biochemistry without mentioning the idea of pH. So I know you've seen the pH scale before, but I just wanted to remind you, right? This scale runs from zero to fourteen, um, where lower pHs are more acidic. Uh, higher numbers are more basic and really at the at the atomic at the molecular level this all has to do with the amount of these hydrogen ions so positive hydrogen atoms that are found in solution so in an acid something with a low pH um, you have a lot of these H plus ions whereas in a base you have a very few H plus ions Um, so when I use those terms acid and base, an acid is simply going to be something that when put into that aqueous environment is going to release hydrogen ions into solution, whereas a base is going to be some molecule that when put into that aqueous environment will basically soak up hydrogen ions that were already in that solution. So think of it as like a hydrogen ion sponge. And, um, you know, we, our, our bodies, our cells have to maintain a very constant pH, right? So life as we know it exists in this very narrow pH range, between like pH 7.35 and 7.45. And that's not to say, you know, you don't have parts of your body with, like your digestive tract, for example, has a, you know, more acidic pH. Um, but actually inside of our cells, Right? you're almost always going to find this uh, very constant pH. And the way our bodies maintain that is with the help of what are called buffers, which are molecules that can um, uh, absorb excess hydrogen ions if present or release hydrogen ions into solution if there's a, a very low concentration. So they can sort of act as uh, the mediator between acid and base. And I thought I'd throw this out there because it's been kind of trendy lately to do these like alkalizing diets. Um, and I just wanted to point out that, you know, no matter how hard you try, you're never going to be able to acidify or alkalize your body. Um, yeah, you, you know, maybe you'll succeed in alkalizing your digestive tract a little bit, but the interior of your cells, it's, it's not going to happen. So if you get just a little bit outside of that narrow pH range uh, that, that our cells like, you're in what's called either metabolic uh, alkalosis or acidosis, and then you get a little bit outside of that, and your cells are dead. So um, basically, your your body, because of these buffers, your body is not going to let you, you know, dramatically acidify or alkalize uh, your cells. So anyway, that's all I've got for chapter two. In chapter three we will start talking about some of these uh, larger molecules that can be built using some of the, the bonds that we talked about here. Um, we'll talk about proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and then uh, nucleic acids in chapter four.